Welcome everyone to our last panel of the conference today on the right to work with dignity and how realizing these rights are part of what it will take to ensure our domestic and national tranquility as well as our security. For those of you who may just be joining us, this conference is organized by the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights and Social Justice on moral policy in a time of crisis. My name is Shalala Gupta Barnes. I'm the policy director of the Cairo Center and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And then in the next hour and a half, we will spend some time on what the right to work with dignity looks like today as we face this pandemic and as we face a pandemic recession. And we're gonna begin our session with a song from Pauline Paisano, an artist, cultural worker, and community organizer in New York. Pauline is a coordinator for the New York State Arts and Culture Committee for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Pauline? Yes, thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Can you not hear me? I hear you. Oh, yeah? Okay, good. Does that sound good now? Yeah. So, yeah. thank you. My name is Pauline. I use the pronoun she, her, hers. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to get started with a song. And we're gonna to sing together, which side are you on? And before we did that, I wanted to offer a brief, a brief a frame history of the song. So the song was written by Florence Reese in the 1930s. It came out of the coal mining wars where it was the workers versus the coal mine owners. And so uh, the story goes um, that Sam Reese, uh, Florence's husband was a union organizer and um, they had gotten word that the people that owned the coal mines were gonna send intimidators to their house. They were informed they were able to hide. And when they got back uh, that night to their house, Florence Reese grabbed a page from a calendar and penned these lyrics. And then um, Pete Seeger and Ani DeFranco uh, have offered their adaptations of these lyrics as well, just as uh, the Poor People's Campaign, A National Call for More Revival, um, has some adapted lyrics as well. So we are going to sing this song together. Okay, here we go. Yes, and I'm playing a 12-string guitar. Pauline, um, for the perfect way to open this session, our last session of the evening on this very question, which side are we on? 
As we all know, the founding documents of this country promise our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But as we also know, if you don't have a job, or today, if you don't have two or three jobs, you don't have the means it takes to secure those rights. You basically don't have them. And this makes the kind of work we do and the terms of our pay and compensation, not just a question between an employer and employee, but really a question of a government to its people and what side it is on, to whom the government will be held accountable, to the workers or to the employers. We know which side we are on. We are on the side that believes that ensuring the right to work with dignity for all workers, frontline and essential workers, workers who are underpaid and overworked, is not only the right thing to do, it is also good economics. As we say, moral policy is also sound economic policy. And so for our conversation, we're gonna hear first from Chris Caruso from the Cairo Center and Shana Bartley from the National Women on the economic context and what we're facing today. Chris is a popular educator, a researcher and community organizer with more than 30 years of experience in the movement to end poverty. And Shauna is the Director of Community Partnerships and Community Development and Income Security and Child Care at the National Women's Law Center. They're gonna start us off this evening and then we'll hear from our other panelists. And as with all of our panels, this session is interpreted in ASL and Spanish. So please speak clearly and slowly and one at a time. There's a button on the bottom for Spanish as well as closed captioning. And attendees are also welcome to drop any questions in the Q&A box below. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and Shauna. Thanks so much, Shelly. It's a pleasure to be here and be with all these other uh, fantastic panelists here today. I'm happy to join you all. Um, I'm gonna present a few uh, brief words just kind of framing our current economic crisis, um, which hopefully will be useful for further discussion. Um, I don't know, uh, I have some slides. I don't know if someone could put up the, uh, the first slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I wanna just start by of course acknowledging the obvious that economic crisis is inseparable from this pandemic that um, were this, uh, this worst uh, public health crisis in 100 years has now killed more Americans than every war since the Korean War combined. Uh, only World War II and the Civil War killed more Americans. Uh, we're facing the third peak uh, right now, and the director of the Center for Disease Control has said that without greater uh, adherence to the public health recommendations, this could be the worst winter from a public health perspective that we've ever had. Um, please, uh, go ahead and advance the slide, please. But it's also true that this economic crisis actually predated the pandemic, that as this chart, chart shows, manufacturing was already well into a contraction before the coronavirus pandemic struck. And we have serious fundamental underlying problems in our economy, including record levels of poverty, inequality and household debt. Uh, we keep getting promised a so-called V-shaped recovery that the economy will come roaring back once the virus is contained, uh, but this is uh, very unlikely. If we can go to the next slide, please, just to talk about the job situation briefly. Um, that uh, we know uh, the latest data is last week, another 1.1 million people applied for unemployment insurance um, which is the lowest initial unemployment claims since uh, they exploded in March. And what the press has largely been selling us is this kind of happy talk that while well, initial unemployment claims are down, so things must have been really, must be really turning around. What's often not noted is that, you know, most states are only offering six months of unemployment benefits and we're in the eighth month of a crisis. Um, so the fact that workers are exhausting their six months of regular state unemployment benefits is not a success story. And it doesn't mean that just because they've exhausted their six months of benefits that they've, uh, you know, gotten jobs back. Um, so I feel that this narrative, while we should be celebrating the numbers going down, uh, is uh, wildly out of step with the actual economic reality of the majority of people in the United States. 
And if we compare this uh, historically, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, um, that last week was the 31st consecutive weeks that had total initial un unemployment claims that were far greater than the worst week of the Great Recession, which is in blue here uh, in 08, 09. Um, and uh, you know, there are uh, three times uh, their pre-recession levels. And so even though there has been you know, a great deal of recovery uh, in terms of uh, jobs lost, we are still uh, in the worst uh, job situation since the Great Depression. We're also, it's also happening at a rate which is much faster than the Great Depression, which was spread out over almost 10 years. Uh, the, this level of job loss in such a short time is really unprecedented that um, the available data from the Department of Labor right now say that a total of 24 million workers are either receiving unemployment benefits or have applied and they're waiting to get approved. We know that uh, Congress let the $600 a week increase in unemployment benefits, which was the difference between many, many people getting by and not, which expired in July. We're now in the 12th week of unemployment uh, where people are not receiving this additional benefit. Um, and it looks like uh, you know, the additional stimulus right now looking like it's gonna happen after the inauguration, which is a, a calamity unto itself. Uh, it is a, a, an absolute disaster. There's no stimulus deal in place as we speak, no second stimulus. Right now, the labor market is still more than 12 million jobs below where it would be if this recession has not happened. Um, so this is not uh, in no way about people you know, avoiding going back to work because uh, they're living high off the dole. This is these jobs uh, have left. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, again, comparing this historically uh, to every other recession since the Great Depression, especially the 2007 so-called Great Recession, the lower down on this graph is the greater percent, the, the percentage of jobs lost compared to the peak. And the right and left is how many months it takes to get back uh, to where it was before the recession. The 2007, 2008, 2009 recession, um, you know, it took a full six years to get those jobs back. Um, that were lost and the jobs that came back paid less um, than the jobs that were lost. Uh, as you could see, although there was a quick recovery in terms of a more V-shaped recovery, you could see in the red line, our current recession, that it has begun to flatten out. And we have a very long road ahead of us to recovery, again, unless there is a massive federal commitment uh, of stimulus funds, uh, which uh, are needed immediately, not, not just in, in January. Um, one of the characteristics of this recession that's different from other recessions is that what we're having is what uh, some folks are calling a K-shaped recession. In other words, those at the top, those very, very rich people who you know, get their income from the stock market, the stock market did dip about 30%, but then massive intervention uh, by the treasury, um, by, all, uh, by all aspects of, of government intervention to pump enormous amounts of money so that all of those losses have been regained. Those at the top are in fact not suffering at all, have made uh, incredible gains uh, during this recession. Uh, billionaire wealth is up by a trillion dollars uh, during this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And this has been you know, incredibly uh, unequally felt in terms of its impact on poor uh, and minority communities. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. And so no you know, liberal, Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve noted early on that among people who are working in February, almost 40% of those in households making less than $40,000 a year had lost a job in March. And this really uh, shows this, this aspect of this K-shaped recovery, how difficult it has been on the poor. We're going to hear more from our uh, coming panelists on you know, how these deep grooves of racism, white, su uh, white supremacy, of patriarchy have meant that um, these uh, have, have greatly hit our indigenous, Black, Latinx communities, and women particularly hard. Um, and we now have whole industries, leisure and hospitality, 
movie theaters and hotels in particular, food services, construction, retail, airlines that um, require uh, massive uh, bailouts if they are to survive this recession. Small businesses in the United States provide over half of private sector employment, and most of them just simply don't have the capital to continue to weather this long-term recession or indeed uh, depression uh, that we may be heading into right now. Um, we know that uh, when we went into this, we were enormously debt burdened, that household debt uh, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, was over $14 trillion in the second quarter of 2020, uh, which acts like a wet blanket on top of a recovery, that even if we can get a little more income in, most of us are going to have to be servicing our debts rather than spending money and stimulating the economy. Um, we know that, again, without massive uh, federal intervention, we have a state and municipal budget crisis that is looming, um, that is going to, again, disproportionately um, affect the poor greatly. Um, let's go to the next slide, and I'm almost out of time. So very quickly, um, we know that at minimum 12 million have lost their employer-sponsored health insurance during this pandemic. Uh, this was a, the study in August, significantly higher by now, no doubt. And there has been zero expansion of health insurance during this pandemic, uh, and in fact, uh, Joe Biden has pledged to veto Medicare for all uh, if he became uh, president during this pandemic. While at the same time, our largest uh, health insurers, if we go to the next slide, have reported uh, enormous profits, have actually doubled their profits to all time highs as they reap uh, literally billions of dollars uh, from denying uh, people care. And we have this deeply dysfunctional privatized health system that has failed to rise to the challenge of this crisis. Um, just to wrap up, um, you know, we live in a hyper individualistic country where many people who are directly affected by this engage in self blame and self shame for the circumstances we find ourselves in, which are objectively not uh, not our fault, not the fault of our own. These are profound structural changes happening to the US economy as a whole, and they require a response on the same scale. And that is what the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival is all about, lifting from the bottom, articulating solutions from those most directly affected, and mobilizing masses of people to force our politicians, whoever wins this next election, to do the right thing, which right now means uh, we, we really need a, a, massive, a massive stimulus in the short term in order for us to prevent what could be one of the darkest winters of our lifetimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, um, for that grounding and reminder, you know, how grim these times are and, uh, and how they demand um, you know, solutions that are as, as proportionate to the, to the crises that have brought us to this point. Uh, Shauna, we know that this is not being experienced equally. I wondered if you could share um, your analysis and the National Women's Law Center's analysis of, of how this is being experienced among women and particular women of color. Yes, thank you, Shelley, and I couldn't agree more with all of the, the information that Chris just shared. I mean, we are definitely heading into a particularly dark time, and we know that women in particular are on the front lines of this crisis. Um, and so I'm excited to share some information with you, and I know that uh, I have a few slides um, also. So again, just thank you, Shally, for inviting me. Thankful uh, for my fellow panelists. I'm grateful to be here with all of you uh, to share more about what we're learning at the National Women's Law Center. Again, my name is Shauna Bartley and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, and I'm part of a team of folks at the National Women's Law Center who fight for gender justice, taking on issues that are central to the lives of women and girls. We drive change in the courts, in public policy, and in our society, especially for women facing multiple forms of discrimination. And I'm very grateful again to be here and share some of what we are learning about how this pandemic has impacted women. Next slide, please. So 
So as we think about what's possible and our opportunity to reimagine an economy that works for all of us and towards shared prosperity, prosperity, it's important to look at where we've been. My colleagues at the National Women's Law Center released a report earlier this year examining our workforce and found that women were overrepresented amongst workers in the lowest paid jobs in this country. Data from 2018 showed that 22.2 million people worked in the 40 lowest paying jobs. Those jobs typically paid less than $12 per hour, making it difficult to cover costs of basic needs and support families. Women make up about 64% of the workers in those jobs, despite making up less than half of the overall workforce. Many of these jobs include work that we know is essential in our communities and provide important services like childcare, home health aids, food service, personal care, and many more. And when we take a closer look at the data, we learn that not only are women over, overrepresented in this workforce, women of color are particularly impacted. Next slide, please. So this chart shows that Latinx and Native women share of low, low paid workforce is twice as large as their share of the workforce overall. This is the same is true for women born outside of the United States. Black women's share of the low paid workforce is one and a half times larger than their share of the overall workforce. And Asian American and Pacific Islander women's share is about 1.3 times larger. This is important for many reasons. It has to do with how we value the contributions of these people in our society. They're doing critical work and deserve compensation and benefits that support them and their families to live healthy and full lives as they define them. More than one in four of these women have at least one child under the age of 18 at home with them. The majority of mothers that are low paid workers are sole or primary breadwinners. So their incomes are critical to supporting their families. Next slide, please. So now we are in a pandemic and as we have described, women are overrepresented in jobs that are low paying and overrepresented in jobs that require work outside of the home. So we are now living through the tragic example of how racism and sexism in this country impacts our shared economic future. Women are the majority of workers risking their lives to provide healthcare, childcare and other essential services while simultaneously being overrepresented in many of the occupations that have borne the brunt of pandemic related job losses. Next slide, please. So in an analysis of the most recent da data available, the National Women's Law Center found that women represent over 53% of the job losses since February. Just last month, 1.1 million workers dropped out of the labor force, meaning they are no longer looking for work. Of that, over 865,000 of those workers were women. This is the vast majority. Women are being pushed out of the workforce as many of the jobs that they have worked in previously, like retail, restaurants, hospitality, and personal care are lost. With the pandemic, women are also taking on the bulk of unpaid caregiving responsibilities in their families, supporting children's learning, caring for other family members as needed, and trying to make the best of a very dire situation. Data released from the Census Bureau's Pulse Survey, which examines how people are faring through the pandemic, reveal that more than half of Black and Latinx women reported loss of empl employment income since March, meaning they have lost their jobs or seen their hours so significantly reduced that their incomes have changed. Each of these numbers represents people doing the best they can through this mishandled pandemic. And I know my colleagues on the panel are going to share more about what they have seen and experienced. However, I am left with one big question as we look towards the future. What is possible if we center the leadership of black and brown women in historically low paying jobs in our plans and our policies to re rebuild our economy? 
how radically different could things be for all of us if we lift up their work and wisdom? Thank you, and I'll pass things back to Shally. Thank you, Shauna. That is uh, at the very heart of the questions that we are asking in this conference and, and we'll need to continue to ask as we, as we identify the solutions that we so desperately need right now. Um, we will now hear from, from people coming from three different sectors of the economy that have been hit really hard in this pandemic and, and she session, um, as this has been called. We'll hear from Sheree Allen, who is a child care worker in North Carolina and a member of uh, NC Raise Up and the Fight for 15. She wasn't able to be here in person, but had some comments to share for the panel. So we have a recorded video from Sheree. After Sheree, we'll hear from Janie Grice from Marion, South Carolina. Janie is a former Walmart worker and an organizer now with United for Respect. And then we'll hear from Beth Contos, the president of the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts. Beth is a proud mother of three and had a career in telecommunications before becoming a high school teacher, teaching history and American government. After these three, um, these three speakers, we'll also hear from Ben Wilkins from the Five for 15 and Derek Hamilton, one of the leading stratification economists in the country. So first, uh, let's start with the video from Cherie. Hi, my name is Sherry Allen, and I'm a worker leader with NC Raise Up and the 515 in the Union. I used to be a child care worker at a small daycare, but I got laid off around the start of the pandemic. They told me that they didn't need me anymore because of the coronavirus. I've seen statistics and news articles about how many child care workers have lost their jobs. One article said that 40% of all child care centers in North Carolina had been shut down by April. The truth is that child care work has always been difficult. My job classified me as an independent contractor and I was paid by the week. When I actually looked at how many hours I worked every week, I was only making $5 an hour. Because child care jobs have historically been done by women and especially women of color, our work has been undervalued, underpaid, and our rights have been unprotected. Now they're saying that child care workers are essential workers, that we keep the economy running. But for years, they have told us that we are unskilled and that we don't deserve $15 an hour. The truth is, all of our low-wage jobs are essential jobs. They have always been essential jobs, and we deserve at least $15 an hour benefits and union rights. Getting laid off has been extremely trying for me. My bills have never stopped just because I lost my job. I was turned down for unemployment be benefits. Um, like a lot of people that I've talked to, I wasn't given a clear explanation of why I wasn't eligible for unemployment. And it's a really difficult system to figure out. My childcare job and many childcare jobs don't give any kind of insurance or paid sick days. I'm still very concerned about getting sick and not having health insurance. I live with my sister Jamila and she works in fast food. Last week, her store had their second outbreak of COVID-19. The first time it happened, she organized with her coworkers and shut down the store. This time, the management didn't even notify employees about the COVID cases. So Jamila and her coworkers are on strike again. Because of this, me and my whole family had to get tested for COVID. When these corporations fail to protect their workers, they're endangering whole families. This is why we say that worker health is public health. When corporations put workers in unsafe conditions and make it impossible to stay home when we're sick, corporations are putting all of us at risk. I just started a new job at a warehouse. After months of looking, if I had my choice, I would rather be taking care of children. But I had to take whatever is available right now. 
No matter where I work, I will continue to organize. I want to tell you that NC Raise Up and the 515 in the union are still going strong during the crisis. I want to share the key demands that we have been focusing on during the last couple of months. We're demanding better safety protections for frontline workers. We're demanding paid sick leave for all workers, no matter where we work. We're demanding health care for all. We're demanding extended compensation for workers who are laid off like me or workers who had their hours cut because of the virus. All essential workers need a permanent raise to at least $15 an hour plus hazard pay. We are demanding real COVID relief for everyone, including all immigrants, regardless of their status. And we are demanding the chance to come together in unions so we can have a voice on the job. These demands are important just so that we can survive. Fighting for union rights is essential here in the South. North Carolina has the second lowest rate of union memberships in the country. 2.3%. And low union rates are actually tied to the legacy of slavery. Racism was used as a tool to divide workers and pass anti-union laws that are still in place today. And these policies have a real impact on our lives. Poverty, racism, and exploitation of workers are systemic problems and need systemic solutions. We are that solution. Low-wage workers of all races coming together as a union. That's the solution. And by union, I mean any time that workers come together, find our collective voice and use it to fight for all of us. When we build power as workers, that power can extend to all areas of our lives. For childcare workers, fast food workers, and all low-wage workers, getting organized is the key to grabbing our political power. Thank you guys for listening. So before we go to Janie, I just, I want us to just pause and, and take in what Cherie was telling us, um, how all low-wage jobs are essential and how they've always been essential and how the solution is right there in front of us. Of, of, of low wage workers organizing and building their power and being able to protect themselves in order to protect all of society. Um, so I think that's just really powerful and we are going to continue to hear um, from, from Jamie. Shelly, thank you for the kind introduction and a special thanks to the Cairo Center for hosting this timely conversation. As Shally noted, my name is Janie Grice and I am an organizer with United for Respect based in Marion, South Carolina. In that text, I like to use my time for remarks today to talk a little bit about retail workers and what needs to be done to ensure that they can work with dignity and receive tangible appreciation from corporations and politicians beyond just hashtags. I'd like to talk about these points from two perspectives. First, from my personal perspective as a former Walmart retail associate, and then from my perspective as an organizer with United for Respect. For four years, before joining United for Respect, I worked in my local Walmart as a cashier and later as a customer service manager. All while raising my son as a single mother and going to school so I could get a bachelor's degree to get a better job. It was during this time that I became part of the UFR family as a worker leader. When I started working at Walmart, I was part-time making only $7.78 an hour. In my four years there, I never got full-time, let alone a stable schedule. It was hard finding time to spend with your family or to go to school and pay your bills when you never knew how many hours of work you were going to get or when you were going to work. I always had to choose my job at Walmart over time with my son because without that income, even as low as it was, we wouldn't have been able to afford basic necessities. 
on my own. And despite the challenges of the job, I got my degree in social work. I now support retail workers across the country who work for the country's largest employers. I deal with the challenges they face every day and develop public leaders who know what changes need to be made so that jobs they will hold will allow them to take care of their families. I am fighting so that frontline workers have a seat at the table developing policies that make every retail job a quality job and to ensure that corporate and public policies really meet our needs. I am fighting to both raise the floor of what we expect from every job and make sure that every worker has fair wages, quality, affordable health care, paid family and medical sick leave, safe working conditions, support for child care, and a real voice in corporate decision making and public policy. These issues are deeply personal to me because I've been there. I understand what it's like to deal with angry mobs of customers to never be able to take advantage of meaningful training or having to care for a sick child or miss key moments in their childhood because of sporadic scheduling. I say all that to say that statements from large corporations like Walmart and Amazon expressing that Black Lives Matter and gratitude for essential workers are not sincere. Walmart associates are still not receiving hazard pay, safe conditions or ad adequate pay time off. Amazon employees are still being held to rigorous performance metrics that compromise their health and safety in the midst of a pandemic. So much so that a recent report confirmed that over 19,000 employees have tested positive for COVID since the beginning of this year. Sadly, the overall conditions of economic instability I faced at Walmart, the largest employer of black people and women in America still continues. My organization, United for Respect, is a national organization of working people fighting for big and bold policy change that improves our lives, particularly those in the retail industry. Our vision has certainly been amplified in this moment by a whole host of politicians, celebrities, executives, and press outlets because of the pandemic. Because of this unique spotlight, oh, excuse me. It is rare to hear these days any discussions about retail employees, those who work at your local grocery stores, big box stores, Amazon distribution centers, food processing plants, and other retail sector stores without hearing the terms frontline employees or essential workers. But beyond public praise and symbolic displays of gratitude, Nothing has substantially changed in terms of economic stability and job quality, at least not yet. So far, we are all missing the once in a lifetime opportunity to transform our society so that the tens of millions of people who work, who make our society function by their essential work earn quality pay and benefits. The COVID-19 pandemic and the movement for black lives have exposed the fundamental inhumanity and immorality of treating our country's low wage workers as disposable and undeserving of basic economic and human rights. This crisis has made it clear that as a society, we must invest in essential workers to ensure the safety and security of the nation. And we know that historically, when programs and policies are deemed necessary for the safety and survival of the nation, things move at a much faster pace with bipartisan support. But demon investment in essential workers as a matter of national security and safety is not just a tactic or hyperbole, it is a reality. In my role as an organizer with United for Respect, the issues I confront are directly related to the harms caused by this lack of social and economic protections. These lack of protections are grossly enriching wealthy shareholders and executives, which prevents investments from being made in the essential workforce. These investments are desperately needed to ensure that low wage workers are adequately protected and willing to work in good times and times like the ones we are facing now. As early as April, Vox reported on the toll essential work has taken on grocery and retail workers early on during the pandemic. 
Vox noted that grocery and retail workers were in the highest risk group for contracting the coronavirus because they had to deal with large crowds and people's refusal to wear masks for social distance. What the current pandemic has done has exasperated an already existing wage, wealth, and opportunity gap that exists in the country because of its stained history on race. I think Senator Warren and Congressman Ro Khanna recognized these realities when they introduced their Essential Workers Bill of Rights back in April. Their policy framework is a 10 point course of action and tangible commitments that they say should shape all future COVID-19 recovery bills. So if we are going to get to the point in this society where essential workers are truly valued and have real opportunities, the real thought is going to have to be given to making the essential workers bill of rights, not just temporary, but permanent. The essential workers bill of rights would among other things, guarantee improved health, and safety protections, universal health care, increased pay, worker board representation, and paid leave, and also whistleblower protection. The Essential Worker Bill of Rights framework also includes bringing workers to the table to have a real voice from everything from government response to public emergencies, working conditions in different sectors, determining specific workplace safety protocols to help them determine how to distribute medical supplies and personal protective equipment. Today, most working people are denied the opportunity to organize to speak with the collective voice, silenced and retaliated against when they do speak out and denied a seat at the table as corporate executives and politicians put their interests before those of essential workers and their families. These are the challenges that essential workers face day in and day out. These are the stories I hear day in and day out. These are the effects that corporate decisions have on black women like myself in essential work and that are made by corporate executives who just a few months ago were shallowly saying black lives matter. An average Walmart associate starting pay falls below the federal poverty line for a family of three. It is shameful that Walmart employees have to live in poverty while working for one of the largest and wealthiest employees in the world. So if this nation really wants a conversation, a real conversation, about dignity for people like me and the people I organize, then we have to address some root problems. And we can at least start with an essential workers bill of rights and a voice for workers in decision-making. Think about what Walmart and corporate America would look like if workers actually had a seat at the table. We would more fairly invest corporate profits and reduce associate turnover. Many associates could finally get off of public assistance and provide for their families. This is exactly why I, felt a share, I filed a shareholder proposal at Walmart's 2018 annual shareholders meeting that would have rewarded hourly associates by giving them a share of buyback profits. So think about what Walmart and corporate America would look like if workers actually had a seat at the table, something called for in the Essential Workers Bill of Rights. Let's push, this, let's push towards this dream by fighting to pass a permanent Essential Workers Bill of Rights and by expanding opportunities for working people who provide the security of this nation to shape the jobs of the future and the protections and safety needed for them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Janie. Janie. Um, and again, I just want us to really hear what Janie's um, offering in terms of, we have a real opportunity to transform our society in this crisis. And there are solutions right there um, that, that, we, that we have been hearing and for a long time. And now is the time to make them possible. Mm -hmm. Beth, could you join us? Sure. sure, I'm happy to talk to you about this. Um, Janie's right on. I know years ago when I worked for one of the phone companies, we had the right to earn stocks as you know we moved along in our careers and it made us invested in our work. Why can't the Walmarts of the world do that or the targets of the world so that people feel invested in their work. They're, they're earning the profits for them, right? So um, I, I wanna say that I am a history and a government teacher. So I'm happy to talk about the constitution and this idea of domestic tranquility, right? So um, I must note that when the constitution was written, many of us 
the majority of us were left out of it, right? Women were not mentioned. Slavery was the law of the land. And the men who wrote it were taking land, lives, and culture from the Native Americans who first possessed the land. So I have to acknowledge that, right? So let's come forward to how we can use the Constitution to create equity for the people who live here now without forgetting all those people, right? So the coronavirus or any other disaster that hits our country is the very reason it's important to have a strong federal government as well as a strong state government. Anyone who didn't know that before this year certainly must now understand what our government should be doing for its citizen and our residents. So as the framers of the Constitution set forth in the preamble, one of their goals was to form a more perfect union. And until the Constitution was written, we were simply a closely affiliated group of states without obligation to each other. And the Constitution was meant to bind us together securely without um, being able to leave each other. It was meant that we would forever be committed to each other's success, right? So that's what we need to work on. One of their top goals was to ensure domestic tranquility. And they meant to have peace and safety at home, um, among the states and within the states. So our question here today is, is, what can our government do to ensure that we have domestic tranquility, right? Well, we're not doing a very good job of it. And in modern days, I think of things like healthcare, public schools, public care for the very young and the very old, as our previous people have mentioned, child care is extremely important. I think of housing. Housing was a topic earlier today. Where, can, where would we be? Uh, where are we with so many of our people not in secure housing? I think of ways to welcome the lonely or the newcomer into community spaces. And these spaces can be things like senior centers, parks, public schools, public universities, and publicly supported childcare centers. And I use the word public intentionally. They must be available to all and supported by all and for the benefit of all, right? Unfortunately, it's obvious that as a country, we have not done a very good job creating and supporting our public services or spaces that lead to a true sense of domestic tranquility. The working women in our communities have been asked to carry the burden of society for a very long time. Uh, I'm president of the American Federation of Teachers for Massachusetts. We have a majority female education workforce as well as librarians and nurses. And um, all these people are parents too, most of them. And they're now trying to juggle teaching, either hybrid or remote because of the COVID virus um, and uh, helping their own children to do schoolwork simultaneously, right? So we understand what workers around the country are experiencing. And uh, many of us also have aging parents to care for. So we're sandwiched in there. And um, a lot of our educators, um, whether they be paraprofessionals or uh, teachers, often had second jobs uh, because of um, high student debt or just because we live places that mortgages and rents are so very expensive, right? And um, those second jobs, many of them are gone now because many of them were in restaurants and we can't be there anymore, not the way we were before. So obviously our safety net is broken and um, many of us are falling through, right? And our essential workers who have jobs like um, personal care attendants or working in the food industry or in hospitals, they have to leave home to go to work. And they are really the ones that are struggling the most because they need to find childcare that fit their needs. So, um, and we can't have childcare be in the very buildings that are already deemed unsafe to be there for education, right? We need um, childcare built buildings on purpose that have the right kind of ventilation. And the other thing is we need them to be open for multiple shifts to help our workers who, who work a non-traditional, the 24-hour workers, right? Especially that's true in, in um, the healthcare system. So I just wanna talk about childcare for a second. As it exists today, it is simply a patchwork of supports. It's not a system at all. 
And not everyone has family that can help. Like I was very fortunate to have my mother retire at the same time that I gave birth. And um, low wage workers pay so much of their budget to childcare that it begins to be worthless to leave the home for work. But we need their work, it's essential. Um, the pandemic has shown us that we need a well-supported childcare system that is independent of the education system. And the childcare workers deserve a, willi a living wage, as we said already, healthcare, and certainly the rights uh, to a union and a good contract. So for too long, women workers have ex been expected to fix all that ails society. Well, it's obvious now, we need help, we need resources, and we need to rebuild our education infrastructure. So um, we have many educators and students in Massachusetts that spend their days in 150 year old buildings. Now I can tell you the ventilation systems are not up to code or certainly not up to COVID code if we want to call it that, right? So these fall in our communities with the least resources. They're the communities with the highest numbers of low income families and where the highest numbers of people of color live. We clearly have not been putting our students or the workforce um, that go to these buildings at the top of our priorities. And these, our state and our federal government is not doing the right thing in all our communities. They're, they're just leaving us behind. So we need to build new schools with proper ventilation. We need buildings without mold, roaches, and rodents. I don't think that's too much to ask for, where we're putting our students every day to stay for eight hours, and in some cases, even longer with extended days. And um, breathing problems are uh, really afflict our poor students the most. And um, it's certainly much more of a threat during a pandemic. Um, and the, that affects the lungs and the heart. So I believe the promise of domestic tranquility is not being met in America, but I do believe it can be met. The, the question really is how we do it. Do we have the will to do it? It's expensive to do it well, but I feel our families deserve it. And the children that I have had in my classrooms over the years, they certainly deserve to have a school that is safe to be in, to have childcare that is safe and to have people working and caring for them um, that have everything they need, right? So we can do things like, you know, tax corporations more or tax unearned income. Um, and I do wanna um, jump on to the idea that one job should be enough, right? We said it already, um, we can't be so tired from work that when we go to do these very important jobs that we can't do it, right? So um, to have domestic tranquility, this is the magic, this is, my, this is my wish list. We have to create an infrastructure that benefits all people in our country. We have to fund our public schools, rebuild roads and bridges, put green energy or build green energy with union work. And uh, we need to then distribute that energy to every part of our country. Um, everyone should be able to benefit from the, the investments we make in our country. And I'd like to see a nationalized broadband effort to get content and access uh, to knowledge to every person in the United States. It's a sin right now as our students are learning from home that many of them are having a difficult time with um, accessing Wi-Fi for their studies. Um, it really should simply just be everywhere. To have knowledge at our fingertips for all would be so powerful for our country. So this is my, my statement here. We can have domestic tranquility if we want it. And how we get it is we need to get organized and we need to tell our government exactly how to spend our money. So thank you. Thank have you. To take any questions on this because I've got a lot of ideas. <laughs> we will have time for discussion and questions, and you know, everyone's offered this incredible kind of response to the conditions that Chris and Shauna laid out. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask Ben Wilkins uh, from the Five for Fifteen 
to, to chime in here. Ben has been a labor organizer for 13 years, uh, working with hospital and nursing home workers, and um, has really studied the labor, labor movement uh, over the course of history. And, um, and then after Ben, we'll hear from Derek, uh, an internationally recognized scholar and stratification economist, and the Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy, and the founding director of the Institute for, study, for the Study of Race, Stratification, and Political Economy at the New School. Um, but first, Ben, would you, would you chime in here? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Shelley. Hey, everybody. Um, uh, it's really great to be uh, with everybody uh, this evening. Uh, so my name, uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Ben Wilkins. I'm a labor organizer, as Shelley said, and, and currently um, the work that I do is as director of an organization called NC Raise Up. Um, we heard from Cherie earlier, who's uh, one of our steering committee leaders. Um, and I really wanted to just talk a little bit about how workers can build power today. Um, so a little bit of background on NC Raise Up. We formed in 2013 uh, in North Carolina and really have developed as the Southern branch of the Fight for 15 campaign, which many folks I'm sure are familiar with. Um, and the work that we fundamentally do is organize uh, poor and low income people, particularly low wage workers, really across sectors and industries and employers. Um, uh, you know, we've engaged in many fights, both federally, state, and locally over the years, um, but currently are really focused on two kind of main key struggles in the context of the current crisis. And you know, the first of those uh, is the kind of massive um, unemployment uh, that, that, that Chris spoke to um, that's impacting especially um, you know, low wage workers, um, especially women, especially workers of color, which, you know, which, which Shanna uh, talked a lot about. Um, and, and uh, that's one main form of struggle that's very new to us because we've typically organized mostly employed workers, but just given the current crisis, um, I think the, the unemployed are a really key sector to be organizing right now. And then secondly, um, what Cherie talked about is, you know, uh, this emerging idea of essential workers. We've known for decades that uh, really all workers are essential and it's really the fast food workers and home care workers and teachers and hospital employees who are the most essential people in our society. Um, but now that that kind of term has risen to the top, we've been, you know, engaging in a number of struggles uh, with essential workers really across the South. Um, so I wanted to pull out a couple of lessons from our experiences about building worker power. Uh, and then kind of talk a little bit about what I think is, you know, some key lessons for the path forward. So I want to first talk about the fight for 15 um, and the struggle to win a $15 minimum wage. Um, you know, the fight for 15 formed in 2012 really organically out of organizing among uh, poor and low income people in New York City and Manhattan. Um, initially talking about housing issues, about transportation issues, but as we were having conversations with you know, hundreds and thousands of workers, what we really saw was that um, many of these folks were working in fast food restaurants for 725 in New York City, which is one of the most expensive cities on the planet. And um, really the issue of wages um, you know, really became a hot button issue at that point. Um, and so the lesson really for us there is that making big, bold demands that resonate with millions of people uh, is the way to build power, one of the ways to build power, because only mass action um, can really achieve what's required. And, and, and since 2012, since the Fight for 15 started, you know, over 20 million workers have won wage increases through legislation, through pressure on corporations. Um, big companies like Amazon have, have raised wages to 15, states like New York, California, cities like Chicago. Um, and we know that none of that would have happened without a mass movement of workers um, and poor and low income people leading those fights. Um, but despite the victories, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and the struggle is nowhere near from over. And I think that's particularly the case in the South. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about an experience in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama in 2015. Um, in 2015, you know, Raise Up, um, along with clergy and elected officials, really came together in Birmingham to fight for a raise in the minimum wage. Um, and the city council, because of the work that the movement did, 
you know, decided that they were going to raise wages to $10 and 10 cents, which is not any kind of extravagant raise. It's not what's required. It's not what people need, but it was a, a massive improvement from 725. Now, these kind of victories have happened, like I said, in cities all across the country, mostly in the north and on the coasts. Um, but, you know, the state legislature of Alabama, um, you know, really just uh, came in and, and, and stopped the city of Birmingham from being able to raise wages. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, the city of Birmingham is um, a majority minority city. It's, I, I think, roughly about 80 percent, 90 percent black. Uh, and the state legislature of Alabama is, you know, dominated by um, by white lawmakers. And so, um, you know, what that struggle really taught us was that, number one, um, the South is a key front of leading this battle uh, where, you know, poor and low income people are facing some of the most serious challenges, not only in the conditions, but in, extreme, in, in extremist politicians and, and, and elected officials who uh, we really see are refusing to even grant the smallest improvements. Um, and so for us in, in the fight for 15 and particularly in Raise Up, we really see organizing in the South and building a mass workers movement in the South as being really, really key to what needs to happen um, in the coming years, especially in this period of, of COVID-19 and the economic crisis that, that Chris spoke to. So I wanna um, pull out three main lessons for us of building power. Um, the first uh, that we've learned, I think really clearly in Raise Up is that worker organizing and union building has to take account of the vast changes in the economy that are impacting workers over the past 50 years. You know, um, Cherie and many of our other members, um, you know, are facing an economy where uh, jobs are, first of all, extremely difficult to come by and where there's, you know, long stretches of unemployment. And secondly, where it's difficult to stay in any kind of a job or have any kind of stability. And so rather than kind of take the traditional union organizing approach of organizing employer by employer, we really organized low wage workers across uh, the state into one big organization, um, really organizing workers where they are, whether they're employed, unemployed, uh, working at McDonald's, Amazon, Walmart, um, all of these employers. Um, so that's lesson number one really for us. Lesson number two that I, I spoke to a little bit um, in terms of advancing the 15 minimum wage is advancing big and bold demands that are gonna inspire millions of people. Um, 15 is kind of a commonplace uh, demand. Lots of folks, I think about 70% of the country support it at this point, but in 2012, uh, it was really considered to be kind of a crazy demand. Uh, it was double the minimum wage. People thought it was never gonna be able to be achieved. But what workers were really saying at that point is this is the bare minimum that we need to survive. And, and I think that as we as a movement um, advance our demands, we have to uh, not be afraid to advance what's necessary for um, poor and low income people to lead a decent life. And, and, and by doing so, we can inspire masses of people uh, into motion. And only when millions and millions of people are coming together and fighting uh, to win, can we win? Because we all know that um, th this change is not gonna happen unless there's a mass movement, which I think is what the, what the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival is all about. Um, and then the third thing th that I think is particularly important right now is that in a time of mass unemployment, when millions upon millions of people are out of work, both due to COVID, but also due to long-term you know, changes in the economy, we as a movement, I think really need to think about what are the kind of jobs that um, not only exist now, but need to be created uh, in order for there to be a better America? Um, and I specifically think of jobs in the care sector, green infrastructure, jobs that are gonna help um, provide social value uh, to everybody that lives in this country. You know, We don't have nearly enough teachers. We don't have nearly enough child care providers. We don't have nearly enough healthcare workers. Those jobs need to be created. We have all the wealth that's required to create those kinds of jobs, meaningful jobs that have dignity, um, but we just lack the um, you know, people in power who have the will to do that. And again, that gets back to creating a mass movement of millions of people um, that's uniting folks all across the country, including in the South, across lines of difference um, to really um, speak with one voice. So 
Um, I'm really excited to be here and happy to you know answer any questions and, and talk more with all of our great panelists. And um, thanks, Shally. That's uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Ben. Um, I really appreciate this lesson about having big, bold demands, not small incremental demands, demands that can inspire and move people and advance what's necessary. And uh, Derek, I know you have really given some, some thought and work around some of those, some of those big demands and wondering um, if you would share with us your thoughts on that. Thank you, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, this panel is so well organized and grateful for all the panelists that have gone before. Um, it speaks to Shally's organization <laughs> skills and, and, and more um, her genius. And I hope I don't drop the ball. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I think what I'm about to talk about, a federal job guarantee, um, is an iteration of the fight for 15. It could fit very well with what Ben was uh, just describing and calling for. So let me begin. The coronavirus pandemic vividly reveals our collective vulnerability um, public health in terms of e and economics, as well as a system that actively produces inequality. A federal job guarantee is a powerful solution and would bend our economy towards racial and economic justice. A public option for a productive, quality job, building our physical and human infrastructure with decent wages, benefits, and proper working conditions. In plain sight, Black people and other communities of color are more than twice as likely to die from the coronavirus. And already 45%, nearly half of Black-owned businesses have already closed as a result of this pandemic. And all day, the old, thus far in this panel, you've heard the employment numbers as well as the accompanying loss of health insurance that goes with those losses of jobs. Uh, that the impact of something presumably random, such as a pandemic, however catastrophic, is so linked to one's racial identity is evidence that our economy is failing. This links to a larger political and economic vulnerability for Black Americans and other vulnerable groups, whether we're in a pandemic or not. In the case of Blacks, the immoral devaluation of Black lives has been ingrained in America's political economy, and it's long overdue for a reckoning. Right now, we should do everything to protect our public health and keep workers, including gig workers and micro businesses um, in place, um, elevated, as well as our aggregate demand elevated and in place. And we need to establish the building blocks for a transformative, secure, inclusive, and more equitable economy so that we will be less vulnerable to the next pandemic, climate-related catastrophe, as well as the everyday vulnerabilities in which many of us live. Changes on the margin won't cut it. To reverse decades and generations of poverty, discrimination, and econ economic and political concentration at the top, we need a bold overhaul of our laws and our economy. We're faced with a choice. We can continue down the path of deregulation, lower taxes on the wealthy, and a gutting of government services and social welfare programs, or make a profound change towards a more sustainable and moral economy with government interventions to facilitate assets, economic security and engagement, human dignity and social mobility for all its citizens, regardless of race, class, gender, and sexual identity. And I use citizens very loosely, not by that uh, strict definition that, that, uh, uh, that, that uh, some people can see. Some lessons from the past Great Recession. We had a long jobless recovery. Inequality grew. Housing insecurity increased. Evictions grew. Um, home ownership, there was a great deal of, of loss of homes. And millennials, as a generation, they were saddled with student loan debt and told to go to college and wait out the recession. And as a result of all of this, I dare say that we were politically vulnerable to a despotic strongman who was able to gain ascendancy on a divisive appeal. 
Although never fully extended to Black people, there is nothing new nor radical about the concept of a federal job guarantee uh, or economic rights in general. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in his 1944 State of the Union address, he called for an economic bill of rights. He called for, quote, physical security, economic security, social security, and moral security. Roosevelt knew that necessitous men and women were not free men and women. For Roosevelt, full citizenship demanded more than political rights. It required economic rights. The first article of Roosevelt's proposed second Bill of Rights was the right to employment. The federal job guarantee concept also has deep roots in our civil rights history. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. pushed for guaranteed jobs in the final years of his life. Coretta Scott King has long led grassroots movements to champion the idea. By ensuring that everyone can have not just any job, but a good job with dignity, wages, benefits, health care, and safe working conditions, a job guarantee would deliver long needed worker reforms. Momentum is building. Senator Cory Booker released a co-sponsored bill with Senators Gillibrand, Merkley, Elizabeth Warren, and Kamala Harris to establish a pilot program to provide grants for a job guarantee program. And Senator Bernie Sanders has gone even further. He's called for not a pilot, but a bold, transformative, full-scale federal job guarantee. Um, indeed, the Green New Deal is grounded with a job guarantee. And there are many members of the House, particularly the squad, that are also calling for job guarantees. Having Americans out of work does immense damage to the human spirit, and it imposes extensive costs on individuals, families, communities, and society as a whole. Yet the current political frame centers the problems of poverty and inequality and racial disparity as deficiencies internal to the poor and Blacks themselves. Blacks have become the symbolism by which we caricature the unemployed and the unemployable as welfare queens, deadbeat dads, and super predators. As a result, the state uses incentives and sanctions to coerce and discipline an underclass, not working to eliminate poverty, but rather to manage seemingly bad behavior with increasingly punitive tactics. We end up with local and state and federal interventions, as well as public-private partnerships that attempt to leverage private and charitable resources to manage these so-called defective black, brown, and poor people to get an education and become more employable. With a federal job guarantee, we could address our 21st century physical and human capital infrastructure needs and increase and decrease the vulnerabilities to natural disaster, disasters resulting from our unnatural climate change all of these are going to require public investments, huge public investments. To be clear, I am not talking about welfare to work or workfare, rather authentic and authentic right to work for decent wages on a productive job. The jobs would range from construction, education, health services, supportive housing, libraries, child and elder care, arts and culture, all these, as well as an infrastructure designed to transform our cities to green, emission-free municipalities that are more sustainable and resilient. The work could include disability-centered advocacy and facilitate more long-term solutions for dignified employee, employment, livable and financial independence for uh, those that might need uh, better working conditions, Similar programs could be designed to emphasize transition from employment to from incarceration to employment for those that are formerly incarcerated. I mean, we could have a care economy with a fair, with a federal job guarantee. With a care economy, not only could we provide provisions, public provisions of care from child care or adult care to elder care, we could also ensure that that work has decent wages, decent working conditions as well as benefits. The federal government, states, Indian nations, local municipalities, 
and community councils could conduct inventories of their needs and develop a job bank of tasks for us to do. Priorities would be given to the most urgent projects to aid the most distressed communities. The work would address, like I said, our 21st century infrastructure needs and produce tangible public benefits. Full-time workers would receive medical coverage, retirement support, paid family and sick leave. The income paid to these employees would also restore our tax bases that have been depleted at state and local levels. Stimulus plans championed on both sides of the political aisle have used tax incentives and deregulation to cajole and bribe a private sector that's been producing record levels of profits to provide more jobs and rebuild our, our infrastructure. This approach leaves workers vulnerable to the whimsical nature of a trickle down employment, as well as the instability of contingent work. Moreover, it is a transfer of the value of our public infrastructure, as well as our public assets to corporate interests with no guarantee that the infrastructure will actually get built in the first place. Instead, a federal job guarantee would provide a direct source of employment, and it would trigger a multiplier stimulus effect across our economy and enable all workers, whether they receive a public job or not, particularly those at the low end of the labor market, to bargain for better wages and benefits without the fear of destitution from that threat of unemployment. It would structurally change the US economy away from low wage work and towards more moderate and high wage jobs. And it would provide a buffer for employment transition that is about, to, that is about that is occurring as a result of automation and technical change. A federal job guarantee would mitigate the personal and familial costs of damaged mental health and other stressors faced by those that are unemployed. The unemployed themselves often say that they would rather be paid to work than receive unemployment compensation. Not only would a federal job guarantee restore psychological balance to millions of unemployed workers who desire to work but cannot, it would address our longstanding unjust and discriminatory barriers that keep segments of stigmatized populations out of the labor force. And it would reverse the rising tide of inequality for all workers by strengthening their labor market bargaining power. And it would ensure that the US government live up to its unfunded mandate and actually achieve full employment and eliminate involuntary unemployment altogether. We need to reject the empirically unsubstantiated and even racist rhetoric that ignorance and so-called grit as well as personal responsibility are all the sources of inequality. We need to also reject the accompanying neoliberal paternalism in which government attempts to coerce and incentivize these insinuated defective pe people to behave accordingly and make better market decisions. What we need are bold, transformative, anti-racist, anti-sexist policies that by design and implementation are intentionally inclusive of all racial, ethnic, and gender groups. Policies that ensure universal and quality healthcare, housing, jobs, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility in our society without the physical and psychological threat of bodily harm at the hands of a state-sanctioned terror because someone's social identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. So to conclude, let's change the paradigm which is what y'all are doing. Let's be bold. Let's work at federal, state, and local levels. Let's work in progressive and conservative communities. And let's advocate for programs and initiatives like the right to a quality job that truly empower people with economic security, dignity, and an authentic agency to define and achieve their goals. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. I think that's the kind of big, bold, you know, imagination um, and reality that we can, that we must make possible. Um, and, and in a way that, that ensures that we're not divided and pit against each other. A big idea like that is only going to work 
if we actually can bring people to the table, if we do build that worker power, if we do take up the principles and lessons of, of fusion organizing that Reverend Barber and, uh, shared earlier. And, and, it, and so I wanna kind of, in the, in the last few minutes that we have, um, open it up to, to all of our panelists um, to, to really ask how, how do you build that kind of fusion? How are you not, how do we, how, how do you manage, this is a question that came up in the chat, the political attacks that, you know, would sabotage this kind of proposal by, by calling it socialist or, you know, that, that would keep people who, um, who may, you know, many of us would benefit from this program, from, from a program like this, from a programs like these in our communities. But sometimes what we, you know, what we believe, what we think is, you know, anyway, there, there, are, there are many things that keep us from, from engaging in that. And I know that the organizers on this call and, um, and, you know, everyone on this call has kind of dealt with these issues. Just want to open it up to all of you to, to offer some of your insight into that. How do we, how do we build the kind of political power we need um, to get to this place? How do we organize for this and, and push back on those attacks and change that narrative through the worker power that we need to build? Go ahead. So, so I find the jargon. Oh, sorry. No, you go. Oh, you <laughs> know, the jargon of socialism and capitalism um, is in the media. It's unproductive because we frankly never practice any of them in their totality. When we bailed out the banks, that sure isn't capitalism. Um, but that aside, one thing that I think is obvious to everyone is that economic and political power consolidate. That with economic power, you can buy political power. And with political power, you can structure a system in favor of you economically. The part of the equation that I don't think is well understood is stratification, is race, and all the other div divisive identities by which we're able to um, I don't want to say manipulate because I think people might be aware of it either explicitly or implicitly. Seduce is perhaps the right word. Seduce people in a context of growing inequality to go along with the immoral benefits of things like male privilege and white privilege. In other words, what I'm trying to get at, it is the existence of economic insecurity that allows somebody like, for, exa for example, Donald Trump to come along and say, however unequal you might be on the spectrum, white people, at least you're not Mexican, at least you're not black, and say, I will codify the rights of white privilege for you. And sadly, um, again, from an immoral perspective, people not only care about their vertical positioning, they care about horizontal positioning. So when we have a social movement that redefines economic well-being beyond the self-interested interest of accumulation that knows no bounds and leaves us vulnerable for that despotic language and start shifting to ideals around um, morality as the people's, you know, as your campaign has been doing, uh, ideas around dignity, that's the game changer, Sol mm -hmm. solidarity, I think that's the game changer and does not leave us vulnerable for that divisiveness that's the third part of that equation of economic and political consolidation. Yeah, Derek, I think you are 100% right. I think what I was going to say is very similar to you is we have to break down the silos that separate us from each other. So what we need to do is have an educator be in a room with a parent and talk about what is needed to make the community better. So why is it that we worked as educators on the, um, the fight for 15? Because we knew so many of our students' families would benefit by a raise in income, right? And obviously I think we know that 15 is not enough, but you know, we'll start there, right? Um, and why did we work on um, healthcare issues? Why do we work on things? Our educators have healthcare but we care very much that our students are well and that our students' families are well. 
because then that creates a much more stable community. And that's what we need to do is organize across the board as, as Ben had mentioned, where we get people in the same room, create coalitions and really talk to each other about what's best for our community. And then we're not labeling it socialism or capitalism or whatever. If you walk into a public school or if your trash gets picked up, you're participated in socialism, whether you know it or not. So, you know, you drive down the road, there it is. So um, we need to cut across these barriers and, and have all workers walk the pavement together. There was, um, there was a question also that came up about the um, compatibility of a jobs program, a jobs guarantee with, with a basic income or really other elements of the of the social safety net that we know are necessary for people who maybe cannot, you know, be incorporated into a jobs guarantee for whatever reason. And um, I'm wondering if there are, you know, some of you could speak to that, how, how jobs and, you know, income, income needs to be guaranteed across, you know, for everybody. Um, and, and it's not a question of, of work. Uh, it's not a question just of the work that is remunerated you know, in, in the economy, you know, just recognize the broad spectrum of work that um, that, that goes on. And I wonder if um, uh, Shauna or others could maybe speak to, to that broad spectrum of, of work and, and how, how these aren't inconsistent. Thanks, Shally. I, I, I don't wanna necessarily speak to, to the question directly because I admittedly, that's not my, um, I'm not as well versed in that. But what I do wanna talk about is that when we look at particularly experiences of women, the amount of unpaid labor that they perform in their communities has propped up our entire economy, whether or not it has been acknowledged. So it's the idea that by caring for children, caring for, for family members, we have said, we have taken issues like caregiving from which we all benefit and somehow controlled the narrative to convince people that these are individual responsibilities. When in fact, these are collective responsibilities and caregiving is really a public good. When we think about how often we interact with caregivers through our day, we're encountering them constantly. And I think one of the biggest uh, lessons learned through the pandemic is that we are all deeply connected in communities and that caregiving is really the thread that ties us together. Our teachers, our childcare providers, our, our healthcare workers, all of these folks that are engaged in the business of care, they're doing it at, at rates that are even um, higher and more felt in a new way because we are not able to connect like we have in the past. And so I'd love to turn to my colleagues to speak more directly to the question, but I would be remiss not to acknowledge that right now, all across this country, there's a significant amount of unpaid labor that we're not acknowledging. And as many panelists mentioned before, caregiving is a, a set of jobs that when we think about the future of work, these are jobs that we cannot automate past that we are always going to need that require skills and learning and, and edu education and have the potential for real, real uh, career ladders, um, meaningful work and work that is so deeply core to our experience in community and as human beings that it's worthy of an investment and it's high time that we, we put public dollars toward it in real and tangible ways to, to really start to speak to the value of it in our lives. I mean, I, I think you, you're spot on, Shana. I think you, you even answered the question. I, I guess I'll try to build upon the answer also and say, there is no one silver bullet policy. Uh, we need to avoid the framing of scarcity and recognize we need a package of goods and we could define what that package is and what are the elements of that package. Basically, we need public provisions for enabling goods that without them, people don't have agency. And we need to make sure that we're not vulnerable from the rationing of the profit motive, where there is the goal to restrict output, to raise prices and, and exploit and extract. So that's where the public sector is needed. 
and we can name a whole host of, of, of goods, and income would be one. So federal job guarantee and, and basic income are compatible and not and are complementary. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, with care work, uh, it is public work, and you know one way to address it is to formalize it with the, with a pup with a wage. With you know you could literally put it under the auspices of a federal job guarantee and put benefits and wages attached to it so that it's not unpaid. Um, but then the last thing with, with basic income, I'll just say that we even have an infrastructure to implement it. I'm not in favor of UBI because with the universal basic income, you'll be subsidizing wealthy people to invest and save, which by definition, poor people, because they're poor, they don't have the privilege to save and invest that basic income. They would consume it. So you unintentionally or maybe intentionally enhance inequality. But with the earned income tax credit structure that we currently have in place, we arbitrarily say that people have to work to qualify for it. You could relax the work condition and literally use the IRS as a mechanism uh, to distribute basic income. And you can do it periodically, not wait to the end of the year. You could do it monthly or whatever. And we can expand the EITC, not just uh, where it cuts off, but expand it to lift more families to the middle class more broadly. Thank you, Derek. Um, and I think on that note, I'm going to actually wrap us up. I mean, when we when we begin this conversation by looking at the dire conditions we're in, there is kind of an overwhelming sense of hopelessness that can take over, especially as many of us are carrying so many of these responsibilities. But it's in this kind of space and with other people, you know, who are actively organizing and building these solutions that we can move out of that and actually see, as, as Janie said, that out of this crisis, there's an opportunity to rebuild our society, to rebuild it as, you know, with a jobs guarantee, with income considered to be a public good. And, and that, is, that is the direction that we, that we need to go. So thank you again for everybody for this provocative and, and hopeful conversation. Um, and thank you for everyone who joined us online today. Uh, we'll come back tomorrow. We're going to begin tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time, um, very early for the West Coast. But we'll have two people from the West Coast joining us um, on a panel discussion, looking at the, taking a look at the long history of systemic racism and white supremacy from the first chapter of our nation's history to the civil rights movement and our current movement, current moment where we're seeing an emboldened white Christian nationalism that is compelling us to, to confront racism in new ways. Um, so as we close out today, we'll hear another version of Everybody's Got a Right to Live featuring Taina, Taina Asili y la Banda Rebelde uh, from the New York State Poor People's Campaign. Thank you everybody and we'll see you soon. Thanks for having us. Five, six, seven, eight. Everybody's got a right to live. Everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail. Everybody's got a right to live. Yeah. <laughs>